and I'll be looking out for your book and your Amazing. podcast. Amazing. And I don't believe anybody can start a podcast. I take that back. <laughs> Hold on to that crown. I'm going to get in so much trouble for this entire episode. Hello and welcome to Girls With Goals. I'm Neve Marr and I am delighted to welcome my guest to studio today. Broadcaster, stylist, fashion designer and entrepreneur Sonia Lennon joins me now. Sonia, thank you Hi. so much for coming in. You're so welcome. Delighted to have you. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to play our game. So okay. it's called Six Words or Less. Okay. And it's for any of our readers and our listeners and our viewers of the show who may not know who you are. So you have to describe yourself in six words or less and it can be either a word, a string of words or a sentence. So in your own time. Okay. Um, I didn't prepare for this. So this <laughs> is... Um, somebody didn't do their homework. I'm going to say loud, fun, ambitious... Uh, social entrepreneur, friend, mother. Nice. Social entrepreneur, are we double barreling it? Or That's is hyphen it? in there. Oh, we're, we're a hyphen. <laughs> so like it's seven. That's seven well, words. Don't make me lose one of those now. <laughs> um, the thing that I was thinking about this game is that a lot of people that come on the show, like, you know, a lot of people know who you are um but i suppose i want to go back a little bit and and kind of talk about your career um because it spanned long time 30 years yeah. right that's yeah. fair to yeah, say yeah. isn't it yeah um but like going all the way back did you have a career plan from when you were a little girl i believe it or not really did want to be a fashion designer okay um or a vet um, oh. <laughs> I do love animals. Um, I think every 10-year-old girl wants to be a vet, don't they? Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It is one of the ones that pops up I think quite so. a bit. Yeah. I think so. Um, but I did have, um, and still have actually, notebooks full of sketches of drawings of costumes and looks and, you know, outfits. And um, at the time, uh, you know, that I left school in 1986. Mm -hmm. So... The idea of becoming a fashion designer was pretty rare, I would have said. Um, it wasn't the kind of explosive industry that it is now. And my parents weren't keen at all. Right. They, they thought it was a, a sort of a bum move. So I was steered away from that direction. Um, and, and actually, like, like most of the sort of speed bumps that you hit in your life, I think that probably worked out for the better. Yeah. Um, in that if I had gone to do fashion design straight after school, there's no way that I would have had uh, what I have now, which is life mm. experience, understanding, knowing what women want, how they want to feel, what's important to them. You couldn't bring that code yeah. to, to a piece of study. Um, you have to kind of live it. Um, so, so, yeah, um, I, I kind of feel that I spent 30 years or 20 years earning the right kind to put developing. forward a product mm. that has relevance. And in terms of like back then, say in 1986, even though you definitely had fashion in in the front of your mind, was it about the financial aspect of it? Was about was it about no, like no. no, as in not because you oh, from my to, parents' point of view. Yes, was it more about like you were going into an industry that would take you an awful long time to maybe kind of earn your stripes, and that was their concern, or maybe that your chances of success were so slim. Yeah, so they yeah. were looking out for you, hundred oh, percent. But it was, I suppose, maybe it was a sign of the times as well. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And so then um, they encouraged me to apply for um, a degree through the CEO, just an arts degree, not just an arts degree, but an arts degree. Yeah. Um, and I just I, I, I got a place in UCD and I just wasn't keen. I just didn't want to um, I, I didn't want to learn about things. I wanted to do things. Mm. And I knew that I was interested in fashion and uh, went into retail. So I, I was a shop girl in some amazing stores and and the learnings from that in terms of understanding what a garment does on a hanger before mm. it even gets on a body, uh, talking to people, selling, learning how to sell. I actually think selling should be a module in primary school. You should be able to sell because all through your life, you're either selling yourself or you're yeah. selling your product or your service. You have to be able to do that, you know. Absolutely. And some people struggle with it's, that. It's I, I struggle with that a little bit because I've never been in a, a selling realm but like you know with my career you definitely have to sell yeah. yourself yeah. and it's a it's kind of part and parcel of every industry now like that's pretty much what LinkedIn is but it's something that you kind of I think get more comfortable with as you become more mature 
and yeah. more confident in your own abilities. Yeah, and women, you know, <laughs> the research says that women really, really struggle to yeah. position themselves for success, um, much more so than, than men, unfortunately. And where um, a, if you ask a woman to negotiate on your behalf, she will come out with the best deal. But mm -hmm. if you ask her to negotiate for herself, um, she, a little bit of self-effacement will come in there and she won't, maybe won't do as well. So I think that selling piece and that kind of um, uh, self-positioning that you speak to yourself like you are your own best friend and say, look, I'm really good at this. And, and historically, as a, as a nation, we've been really bad at that. You yeah. know, it's that, oh, who does your woman think she is, you know? know? But now I think it's changing, you mm -hmm. know? So um, it's okay to say, look, I'm really, really good at this. Absolutely. And so if we were to go back again, because we're kind of like yeah, delving into... Yeah, it's going to be like that. We're, like, <laughs> we're delving into dress for success, which we are going to talk about, of course. Um, but I suppose, you know, you were working in retail yeah. and fashion, then you were around it. Yeah. Um, but you did still want to have a little bit of qualification. And so you kind of went the fashion PR route, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, well, I was living in Paris at the time and I applied for... Or, um, a fashion PR course in Rathmines, which I did, and that was great. And met some great people, and um, had a great fun year. But actually, went back to retail then again afterwards. And uh, I suppose from there, from being surrounded by the clothes in the stores that I was in, and really beautiful, high-end international collections. Um, I was exposed to the idea of styling and mm. there was only very, very few stylists in town at the time. So Catherine Condell, um, Susan Howick, Helen Cody was styling at the time, maybe about five stylists. Okay. Um, Nadia Pfeiffer is another one. Um, and, and so they'd come in and they'd pick out clothes for fashion editorials and shoots. And certainly there was no uh, uh, PR agencies that carried collections. Yeah. Nobody was going to London to, to bring in samples. That wasn't happening at that time. So when I saw the work that they were doing and I saw how they were basically using clothes to tell a story, mm. I just thought, oh, my God, this is the most amazing job. Yeah. Like, how did I not know about this? And then um, I suppose it took me, took me a year or so to realize, well, I can stop ogling them and start doing it myself and see how that works out because what have I got to lose um and so yeah I just got stuck in and started putting together test shoots and, and yeah. was it just networking because obviously like social media wasn't as well it just wasn't there it didn't th exist it just wasn't there <laughs> was like, it wasn't I had a mobile phone and I was mortified yeah so it was <laughs> I was about to say like well maybe you had Bebo no it definitely just wasn't no. there at the time so networking and when you say like getting stuck in yeah how exactly did you kind of get stuck in because now I, I look at like people in the fashion industry and people who say want to become stylists and stuff like that there's obviously the whole styling for you know high-end fashion editorials mm -hmm. and then there's tv and commercial. there's kind of becoming the talking heads and there's commercial so like back then when maybe you were competing with a smaller pool was it still very difficult or how how was the networking process in say the 90s in fashion um i, I think it was it, it was a very different uh, community in dublin it was very small so everybody knew all the photographers all the makeup artists mm. um, the, the handful of stylists hairdressers and so we knew each other um, and we, we started to work together and, and to produce a body of work that we funded ourselves just for our own um, sort of creative uh, gratification and then very shortly after that uh, I was asked to assist on a shoot for uh, Decide magazine and uh, that led to me becoming fashion editor there so it was two shoots a month kind of very high creative low budget high creative so a lot mm. of street castings yeah. um, and and from there then uh, I became exposed to kind of commercial projects and at the time it wasn't it, wa it wasn't one or the other and I'm not sure it still is one or the other mm. because fashion editorials are never gonna um, make a living for you you're, yeah. you're just it's not gonna happen so you have to supplement that with commercial work right okay so then I'm just like so fascinated because I'm I'm learning about like how you got from one place to another so when did the broadcasting element kind of come into it? Because a lot of people know you as a TV presenter yeah. as well as a stylist and as well as a designer. Um, so was that something that you were approached to do or was it something that kind of because of your work as a fashion editor 
and stylist. It, it, it so happened at the very time, organic. I, and, and it's funny because I actually only now, as we're having this conversation, I'm realizing that my entire career has been a sort of a repositioning exercise. But it's so <laughs> crucial, though. Yeah. It's so important to be able to do that because if you get stuck in one thing, yeah. like imagine you hadn't have repositioned yourself in all yeah. the different ways that you did. Yeah. So I had been a talking head on uh, head to toe first and off the rails and afterwards, mm. and I was kind of contributor, a stylist, uh, I would style shoots for the show because at the time they had kind of standalone fashion shoots. And then RTE approached me to do um, a, a makeover on um, curvy women. Okay. And I said, oh, I don't do makeovers. I'm a fashion stylist. Like I'm, you know, I do fashion editorials and yeah. music videos. I don't do makeovers. And um, they said, well, you know, this we, we feel re very passionately that this is going to be a really good item. We've got eight women um, from all over the country. And I said, OK, well, I'll only do it if we can shoot it like an editorial, if we can shoot it like a tableau of, you know, amazing curvy women in all their glory. And we have a theme and, you know, if it could sit as a double page spread, basically. Right. So we did it and it was massive body of work. We were calling in. This was before uh, online had really exploded. Yeah. We were calling in. Uh, uh, plus size clothing from from shops all over the country. It was a massive piece of work. Anyway, we did it. Um, the, all the participants absolutely loved it. They looked amazing. And at the end of it, the producer said to me, I don't think this is the last you've heard of this slot. Yeah. And that was, um, I think that was maybe like May or something, we did that piece. And then by July, I got a phone call from RTE saying, look, would you, would you screen test um, to present the show? And I was like, OK. And I had another very, very big gig coming up, big mm -hmm. show. Um, is this off the rails now to present the to show? To present off the rails. Right, yeah. And I did a really, really big kind of fashion festival piece of work coming up that would have been very um, uh, well paid mm -hmm. and it would have been a big body of work for the summer. So I had these two options in front of me and I thought, well, do I go and try out to, to present this show? Do I uh, do the fashion festival? And I thought to myself, and I agonised over for ages because actually I wasn't, um, I w didn't want, I d nothing in me wanted to be a TV presenter particularly, mm. you know, I, I wasn't in my game plan. Um, and then I thought, hang on a second, if I don't do this, um, it'll never come back. Statistically, yeah. the chances of being asked to present a second TV show, it, it won't happen. Mm. So I kind of owe it to myself to do it regardless of my fears. And my fears weren't around the presenting. My fears were around losing my clients, right. losing my foothold professionally yeah. and possibly not being taken seriously yeah. anymore. Um, so I said, OK, do it. Um, and then they uh, matched myself and Brendan. Right. Um, and we knew we knew each other kind of as as acquaintances. We didn't know each other very well. We had very good mutual friends um, and it just worked. It was such uh, like I remember off the rails as just being such a, a breath of fresh air because I feel like it was definitely one of the first times that you know, TV studios were really investing in fashion. And like you were saying there about the makeover slot being so popular, I literally like the early 2000s, maybe late 90s watching, do you remember Jenny Jones yes. and Oprah Winfrey? Yeah. Like you'd watch those shows, but the makeover shows yeah. were like my ultimate. Yeah. I was obsessed with makeover shows. And I, d I don't necessarily like know what it was. I didn't necessarily, I always used to think, well, they don't need makeovers, you yeah. know, like maybe they're comfortable or what, but the transformations, I was just yeah. completely transfixed by it. And I, I people just love a piece of journey yeah. storytelling, you know? And and actually myself and Brendan, as part of our, our deal, said we have to sign off on all the yeah. candidates. We mm -hmm. have to interview them. We have to be part of that process. We want to know why. Anybody who put on their form, I just really want to pamper. We we bend it yeah. straight away. There had to be a narrative. There had to be a backstory and a validation of why it was important for them to do this. Um, and actually, we we fought really hard to have um, revisit shows yeah. because you know these amazing women would do this thing. It would become a catalyst for change. And all of a sudden, we'd be getting emails and texts saying, "Oh, I left my husband. Uh, the marriage is off. I left my job. I bought a camper van. Wow. I lost five stone. Yeah. Like all these amazing things happened because those women felt confident enough to 
to move beyond their circumstances. It's funny because in terms of like the actual format as well, like you see, and especially nowadays, like we see formats of TV come and go. Some of them work, some of them don't work. But like, I think one of those types of shows you can still see it like it's it's now used around the world like these kind of shows that it's not just about the clothes it's more a transformative kind of process yeah and it just doesn't necessarily ever look like it's going to go away people like when an audience just clicks with something yeah. like that like i'm it's, just it's, I, it's changing rooms in different clothes you know yeah. it's 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 we want to see you know, this is the starting point and this is the end point and I can feel gratified by that resolution, you know. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I think myself and Brendan both feel strongly that uh, the medium for fashion now is in your hand, yeah. you know. So it was of its time, I think. Mm. Um, we get asked all the time, is it About, going back? Well, is this is back? like the year of the remake, though. Yeah. Like everything is coming back. Would you, yeah. would you ever consider? I, I don't think so. I think, I think it... I think it should be held in, you know, aspect held there as something that was really good of its time. That's the problem with remakes sometimes yeah. when they come back, you're just like, mm. yeah, yeah. Anyway, I don't know where we'd fit it into the schedule at the moment. Well, that's you know? it. I mean, so in terms of you and Brendan, and that was kind of obviously you knew each other before, but um, a partnership was very yeah. much sparked and and is did Lennon and Courtney come from that or was it like a, a was it something that you always had on your mind that you wanted to have your own line anyway? So um, if, you, if I go back to 10 year old me, there probably was a bit of that in yeah. there. But I think also um, every time that we put something on a woman mm. and the big reveal was made, it would sell out in 24 hours. Right. So we knew so you're onto something, we knew yeah. we had something. We knew mm. we could connect with what people wanted. And also we couldn't always find the. We just knew we want this thing and it doesn't exist. So we, um, we'd been tinkering around with ranges of magic knickers and all sorts of stuff. And, and then um, we were actually approached by um, a, an acquaintance of mine again, said, look, you know, you guys should be making clothes. Like mm. people love what you do with clothes. You know what you're talking about. Um, you should do a range of clothes. And we were thinking, well, you know, okay, maybe. Yeah. And we didn't have a clue. Like we, we were, literally coasting on ignorance um, and it's probably the best way to have done it um, because if we had known what was ahead of us we probably would have said actually you're okay <laughs> it was really, really tough. massive yeah yeah but massive. I mean obviously you know you know clothes you know the the fit of clothes you know what looks well on on a body but what was the difference between being a very highly accomplished editor and stylist to actually designing like what was the work process business yeah. Business was the missing piece. So for me, when I um, when I started off the rails, just to give a bit of context, I and, and my profile kind of grew mm. and, you know, people wanted me to open events and sponsor uh, charities and, you know, be an MC at a gala or whatever. Yeah. I thought, OK, well, so people are approaching me. So there's obviously some value in my presence or my voice or whatever it is um but i don't i want to own that i don't want somebody else to tell me that they want me to sponsor their charity whatever it is um i have a kind of an obligation now from my position to to do some sort of social good um, and when i read about dress for success uh, i i just thought this is it this yeah. is an organization that helps women to gain confidence to succeed at interview by giving them clothing mm. and and a narrative and a positioning to push themselves forward. And so I that was my first foray into business where I had to write a business plan, apply to New York to be granted the license to bring Dress for Success to Dublin, yeah. uh, identify board members, premises, business plan, revenue streams, partners, where were the clients going to come from? Yeah. I had to basically do, it, it, they said it was an, a business plan, it was actually an action plan, yeah. which was amazing because when I finally did get granted the license to, after a year and a half, I was ready to go. It took a year and a half to actually yeah. get the license. Yeah, wow. it was. And, and I'm pretty sure that that was a test of tenacity, yeah. that they made you jump through hoops so that they could see if you had what it takes. Because actually in, in business and entrepreneurship, most of it is around having the sticking power to not fall over. Yeah. And I mean, just in case anybody isn't aware of what Dress for Success does. Um, so it promotes the economic independence of women by providing career development tools and a support network as yeah. well. So, I mean, that sentence in itself is so 
hugely powerful. Yeah. Um, so it's not just about putting them in a dress. Absolutely not. And and I think, um, you know, it's it's one of the, the challenges for us as an organisation is to say, actually, the, 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 the outfit is really just what you can see above the waterline. Yeah. The rest of it is, is beneath and it's it's much more holistic. And so what other services then are, are offered to the people who kind of come to you? And I suppose the other question is like, you know, what what kind of people are coming to you? Um, the women that come to us, they could be any woman, yeah. any woman in any room at any time. Um, and maybe just things haven't worked out for, for any number of reasons. So we have early school leavers um, we have members of the immigrant community. We have uh, women with doctorates. Mm -hmm. We have women who have been very successful in their careers and have lost their footing. Women who have been at home and are now divorced and need to get back into the workplace. It's very, very broad. So it's about, you know, obviously like, you know, dress for success. It, it is about, you know, the clothing and the way that clothing can make you feel, but it's also about giving these women skills yeah. that can then kind of reintegrate them into the workforce. Because like everything that you just said there, it's incredibly daunting, mm. I would imagine, for, for even somebody who's gone and had a family yeah. and then are deciding to kind of come back in. Because, you know, I always feel like, I don't like the term rat race, but like it is competitive. It, no matter yeah. no matter what industry you're in yeah. at the moment, especially in Ireland, and so you know, there's the sense of like, well, if I'm a if I'm a woman and I want to go and have a family, and then I want to come back to the workforce, like, is anybody going to want me? Because there might be twenty other people who are coming, you know, through the gate as soon as I go on maternity leave. So, so I'm sure that's so something. So we we are in a country that has a skills shortage at the mm. moment. Um, so we are considered to technically have full employment. Um, but there are 220,000 women on home duties. Um, uh, some of them want to be, some of them don't want to be. Mm. Um, and those two, uh, there are two groups within that 220. Now, the larger group are younger women um, who have reached second level education, mm. who are mothers um, and, and who've never worked. Now, that's, that's a whole pool of women um, that, uh, you know, could benefit and they're next generation and their community could benefit from them being economically independent. Mm -hmm. That could change the course of lives in their community. The other group who have reached third level or higher who are on home duties, uh, who, could, who could come in at a different level and, and, and help the pipeline of women to leadership mm -hmm. within organisations. That's an incredibly powerful cohort of women. And one of our things is really we need to we need to have two different strategies to connect with both those pools of women yeah. and tell a different story and give them different tools to succeed. Why do you think that it's got to that stage in this country? I, I don't think it's got to that stage. I think this is legacy. It's, it's just always yeah. been like yeah. that. So it's about actually changing it yeah. now. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, you hear stories about other countries that are that are doing better in terms of that, that like have better opportunities for women to re-enter the workforce and to stay in the workforce. Yeah. And you know, you hear things about paternity leave and you know, it's a, it's a big talking matter at the moment, but you know, it's not fair to say that it's gotten to that stage. Yeah. Then it's more so about the fact that this is something that's just in our history. So, so we've 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 taken the lid off the box now, yeah. and we're discussing it, which is amazing mm -hmm. because for many years we didn't. Um, and you asked about the programs that we roll out for our clients, and they're sort of one-to-one -one services in terms of that packaging inside and out, out piece. It's also mentorship, re returnship programs. So really putting um, the right programs in place to unlock that potential and bring yeah. those women forward. So. So peer networking, um, you know, everything from financial literacy to nutrition. Yeah. Things that can help them to be the best version of themselves for themselves and for their employer and for their families. And even things like I saw as well on your website, like you offer things that sound so simple, but things like interview prep, yeah. like things like this that not necessarily you wouldn't think of, but that you might take for granted yeah. and you might go in there and... Like freeze up, yeah. do you know what I mean? So. And actually all of our volunteers, and our volunteers are extraordinary, we have a pool of about 100 amazing volunteers that are all professional, um, mainly women, um, and they are active uh, interviewers. Mm. So they're at the coalface, they know what's required. Mm. Um, it's not a, a case of delivering theory. Um, our volunteers have to have five years uh, experience in being an interviewer mm. in order to prep these women. So. Our volunteers get more out of it than our clients sometimes. They're like, I've always wanted to be able to say, no, not, don't, don't say that because that does the wrong thing because of this. 
but why don't you put it this way? And, and so often it's like back to where we began. Yeah. It's a positioning piece. Like, who are you? Why are you valuable? What do you bring to the table? And, and, and how can you bring forward those transferable skills to show that you're committed? And since Dress for Success Dublin has kind of been around, obviously it took a while to kind of get it all up and yep. running a year and a half. Um, and since it's been going, like, well, I suppose more so the question is before it started or when you finally kind of got the go ahead, were you concerned or nervous about whether there would be any uptake? Terrified. Really? Terrified. And I remember when I got the email from New York to say, congratulations, yeah. we've awarded you the, the license. And it was late at night, they'd sent it at lunchtime or something. And I was on the couch with Dave and I burst into tears. And I, I knew things will never be the same again. Now this is, this is a Rubicon crossed. Mm. I've made a decision to take my life in a completely different direction um, and to build an organization, to, to, to turn my back on um, being a kind of a lone gun for hire, which is what I had been, yeah. and to now build something from scratch. Yeah. So I knew it in my heart. And actually th the irony is that without having um, formed Dress for Success, I wouldn't have had the confidence to go on to form Len and Courtney with Brendan. So this, yeah, I mean, like, that's what I'm kind of going on to next. So this was obviously like a huge business yeah. uh, move. And, and obviously, like what you were saying before, there was a huge amount of work that yeah. went into it. So then when Len and Courtney came about, were you like, dab hand, I've got this? Well, I, <laughs> I don't know if I'd say dab hand, but you cer I, I certainly knew more than I, than I had done previously. Yeah. And I felt um, having, having launched Dresser Success, as a not-for-profit organization. I thought, well, I need to then use those skills that I've learned um, and Brandon's skills. Brandon had, had formed his own company mm. in the UK, a film production company called Giant, which he had sold to Elizabeth Murdoch. So he had definitely been at the rodeo as well. So we said, why don't we just pool all our knowledge um, and, and launch this thing forward? And, you know, it, it, um, in a way, the model of fashion in its entirety is flawed. Yeah. Um, and for three and a half years, we um, laboured. We didn't take a penny out. In fact, Brendan turned around to me um, a while ago and he said, how did we live when, when we launched Len Courtney? I can't remember how we lived. And I said, uh, I'm actually not entirely sure. Why do you say that it's flawed? What, what, what about the whole... Because to launch a new label, mm. um, your, your power... Um, to negotiate with manufacturers and suppliers is so tiny that you're like a piece of dirt on the end of their shoe. So really? you have nothing, you have no volume, uh, you have no... Even with your, because I mean, you guys, d you, you had your names, you know, and it's almost as if, would you not have been given a little bit of credit for the fact that, you know, we're here, we're established, we want to do this. You know, well, it doesn't really work that way yeah. because it's not a personality contest. It's it's a numbers game, right. and if you have to produce a short line, a short run of one garment, that costs X to a manufacturer. Yeah. If you can produce ten times that, all of a sudden there's a margin in there for the manufacturer. Right. So it doesn't matter how smiley and nice and beautifully dressed you are, really, still it's business. Be like, yeah, it's business. Right. So for the first <laughs> while. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never start a fashion line anyway. I'll tell well, you that do you know, and, and that I suppose that brings me to the next piece, which is we fundamentally believed yeah. we were doing something good, but we couldn't make the business model work. And that's where Duns came in. Okay. And so when we when we changed the model mm. um and launched Len and Courtney at Dunn's stores, that changed everything. So all of a sudden we were part of a greater network. Yeah. Uh, the, the, we had logistical support, we had um, more buy, buying power, um, we had the ability to deliver the product at a better price to the marketplace. We knew more women wanted our clothes than could mm. afford them. So for us, being able to democratise the price meant a huge amount. And who are the women? Who is your client for Len and Courtney? So uh, there is a kind of a ripple effect mm -hmm. out of one particular woman um, who is, I suppose, um, a version of me to some extent. Um, she is a professional woman. Um, she probably has one or two kids. She uh, really, it's really important to her to look good, but she's not a slave to it. Um, and she doesn't want problems, she wants solutions. She's smart, she's plugged in, she loves fun, she loves her friends, um, and she doesn't want fashion to be a chore. That's our woman. She doesn't want fashion to be a chore. Yeah. 
That's a really good phrase. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Does she wear those pants? She will soon. Hey! <laughs> At the moment, there's only one pair. Can, can, I, I, wear can I wear those pants? <laughs> um, so with you and Brendan, you said that when, when Dunn's and that partnership happened, it was uh, a game changer yeah. for Len and Courtney. Um, do you guys ever completely disagree on a design aesthetic for a certain line? As in like, will Brendan come in one day and be like, I want to do this? And you'll be like, Absolutely not. That is Sometimes horrendous. Sometimes you do. I mean, I think I think it's the kind of Pareto principle. Mm -hmm. Eighty percent of the time we we agree, right? Um, okay. And twenty percent of the time we'll have kind of um, outlying ideas. And how do you kind of well? Mold it's a, it's or... a really interesting question because we're actually we we're in the middle of redesigning our design process at the moment okay. because what um, there's a great book um, called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. Um, and it is a guy from by a guy called Marshall Goldsmith, and it basically says, you know, certain attributes, skills, and experience and behaviors will get you to a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, but just because it got you there doesn't mean that those are the right skills to take you beyond that point. Right. And I think we're at that point now in Len and Courtney, where it's it's growing. Mm -hmm. um, we we're delivering new new collections every month. Wow. Um, it's it's just exploded. Yeah. Um, so so we've had to kind of look at how we do things and say that's not really fit for purpose anymore. Okay. And and what are the decision making tools that we employ now to make sure that everybody is content that they're getting their say, that everybody is you know that we're making the right decisions um, in terms of what the customer wants. Like that's yeah. that's the ultimate. How how do we know that we're presenting a collection? That, that she needs. And obviously, you know, when you say that it's it's blown up and stuff like that, it's so well established now as well. Like everybody knows the name, everybody knows the label. I don't think they do. I, I think, think they do. No, well, Maybe it's just because uh, I'm the woman who wants see, those pants. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's the danger mm. um, of thinking that everybody knows. Like, right. uh, uh, you know, once a week somebody will come up and say, oh my God, I didn't realise you were in Duns. No. Yeah. And and so, wow. it, because I think we're we're at a we're at a time when we're telling a story, and and over and above that, Duns are telling a very powerful story about where they've positioned themselves, what yeah. they've done with their stores, and actually, you know, uh, you make assumptions that everybody knows. I don't think everybody knows. It's constantly evolving, and I suppose the thing is, is like you have this line, right? You have this label, um whether or not everybody knows about it, you can't say it's not a success because it is a success. Yeah. It's doing incredibly well. Um, but it's almost like, do you know the way everybody has a podcast now? Do yeah. you know what I mean? And like something is constantly coming yeah. out every single day. Um, fashion as a whole has changed so much because, you know, when you were starting off as a stylist, you said there was only like five stylists in the whole country. And now every other person on Instagram yeah. is a stylist. So well, everyone's like, a stylist. Well, everyone is a stylist. And so that's the thing. If you, have, like, a, what defines, if you have an Instagram account, you're a stylist. That's the thing. So yeah. it's all changed. But I, I still don't think, like what you said about the business model and the importance of that, like not everybody can have a fashion label. Do you know? Oh, no. Not everybody it's a very can different have, thing. It's a very different thing. And that's what I think is is a crucial component of, of what it is that you do. Do you know what I mean? Like anybody can literally start a podcast from their living room and everybody can be an Instagram stylist, but you can't have a label that's up and running in a, in a massive, you know, yeah, store it, it, that's it, available it, it's for definitely, people. It's definitely a different set of skills. Yeah. Um, and uh, like I said, it's not for the faint hearted. No, but you guys are going to be authors now as well, right? Yes. <laughs> so you've got a book coming yep. out. Yeah. Tell, so we're tell me a bit about we're that. We're going to. Speaking of everybody's doing podcasts, we're going <laughs> to. Uh, we're going to run a series of events. Okay. Uh, and and basically evolve the book mm. uh, in conversation, um, and it's called the Loving Wolf. Lovely. Um, and it's really, I suppose, about our process mm -hmm. that we've adopted to. Um, to kind of control the controllable and manage the uncontrollable. And I think p part of our success is being able to stand back from stuff and and, and um, set our course mm -hmm. and make sure that we're staying on that course because otherwise you waver all over the place. Um, so we're, we're very clear, myself and Brendan, personally, where we want to be, you know, 
professionally where we want to be. And, and we are ambitious for ourselves as, as humans and ourselves as business people. Um, and it's, it's about keeping that kind of North Star mm. in vision and, and, and making sure that you're, you're doing everything you can to get there. Because I think too, too many people um, live their life passively. Yeah. And that's fine, except that we, we all have infinite potential mm -hmm. in that you get to the top of your potential and you just unlock more yeah. and you unlock more and you unlock more. And that's not about money. It's not about, you know, fancy things. Yeah. It's about impact and purpose and, and what, what, what you want to leave behind you. Well, I'm going to listen to your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, I'm going to run out here, I'm going to start a label, <laughs> I'm going to listen to your podcast. Do you ever get exhausted, like you've got you've got a lot of balls in the air, is that kind of fair to say? Like you've got so many different things that you do and I think, you know, like we were talking about earlier with your career, you've jumped from different things and, and it, it, all with, you know, moving it forward. Um, but like that must be hard to juggle at times too. So... Um Yes and no, okay. right? So I'm not a details person. Mm -hmm. um, I am very good at having great ideas. Um, I'm pretty good at executing them, but only with the help of others. Right. So Dress for Success is um, a phenomenal organization run by Angela and Nula and fueled by volunteers and amazing um, people who work in admin in the office. The clients are amazing. That's, that's an entity mm -hmm. on its own. Um, that, that runs pr pretty much independently of mm -hmm. me. I have my role in there um, and it's very clear. Um, with Len and Courtney, uh, again, Philippa and Josh and Julie are the lifeblood and um, Lisa are the lifeblood of, of, of the execution of Len and Courtney okay. and bringing it into being. Myself and Brendan are very clear where our skills lie. Mm. And we're evolving those all the time. And like I said, we're redesigning the design process. And then in terms of designing, and marketing, there are key skills. So I think the way that I manage it is by not trying to do what I'm not placed to do. Which is a skill in itself. Yeah. I think so, because yeah. I sometimes the fear is if that your name is attached to something, you know. That you need to control it all. Well, delegation is just such a huge thing that I think a lot of people struggle with because yeah, like, you know, what if the ball yeah. is dropped and, and your name is the attached to it? The balls sometimes drop, you know, and that's yeah. life. Um, but so it, it's about it, the team and, and you're very much like... 100%. Yeah. 100%. And, you know, I, I'm honoured to uh, present Architects of Business. Yes. In this very studio in a different guise. Uh, Our brother site. I know. We'll I, give them a plug. <laughs> but they used to nick my table, actually, oh, but that's terrible. fine. Yeah. All of the fabulous uh, Entrepreneur of the Year... Mm. Uh, business people that I interview say the same thing. I always ask them, why is your business a success? And nine out of ten times they'll say, the people, the team, you know, the people who I surround myself with. And that is, that is key. You, yeah. cannot, you cannot build an empire on your own. You just no. can't. And even to the point where myself and Brendan often say, I couldn't do this on my own. I couldn't do it as one person at mm. the top. The, the, the comfort of having the two of us there to support each other and to fill our own skills gaps yeah. is, is so valuable. And so, I don't know if this is a silly question, but like... No silly question. What's next? I mean, like, you know, what is it that you... Obviously, you're going to be doing these events and you're going to be running a podcast, um, which I think is really just about getting to know the people who are kind of there anyway, you know, yeah. like tapping into the audience a little bit more. Um, so well, what? for us, it's not so much about tapping into the audience anymore, but offering um, a value add. So, mm -hmm. so we, we deliver something that we know our woman wants, mm. but we know we have um, the ability to deliver her something else okay. that, that, will, that will be a different kind of solution. And we want to share that. OK, so value add, which is yeah. um, obviously just as crucial. But yeah. so what's going to be next for you then? Well, in the actually, I, I have I have. Um, another not-for-profit initiative called mm -hmm. LIFT, which is Leading Ireland's Future Together. Okay. Um, it was founded by Joanne Hessian, and I, I am co-founder, as is her brother, David Hessian. And that's really about delivering good leadership values across mm -hmm. the Society of Ireland. 
in, in all sectors. So at the moment, we are delivering it into corporate Ireland, uh, into sports through Munster Rugby, mm -hmm. into um, not-for-profit, Dress for Success, yeah. um, and some other fantastic uh, organisations. Um, we are also delivering it through education in secondary school. And it's an eight-week programme to just analyse and assess um, eight values that the nation of Ireland have have hold as the top values that need support, things like respect, integrity, accountability, listening. Um, and, and it's a work through, a 20 to 30 minute work through once a week for eight weeks to, to really understand those values, why they're important and how to live them. I think that's so interesting because, you know, when I think back about my own education and what like I learned while I was going through it, leadership skills was never really something, it was always just about like get the degree, get the education, get in there and then work your way yeah. to the top. Um, but, you know, important things can be missed by some people and I think that can be seen in some of the upper structures of management that are in the country yeah. at the moment. So it seems like a trick missed. So It absolutely is and I think the misconception is that people think that leadership is a positional piece. Yeah. It's because you have a title. We, we all lead people. Yeah. You know, whether whether we like it or know it, mm -hmm. we, 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 we exert our influence on people around us all the time. If you're a parent, you're yeah. a leader of your household, you know. So how are we going to live that in the best possible way to not only give the people around us the best way to live, but, but to, to have a platform to discuss it? Yeah. So why is it not OK to not listen to somebody if they're speaking to you? And I mean, you said there was eight yeah. that kind of you work yeah. through. Um, can you give us like a couple? So listening obviously is one, but what would be the other kind of... So uh, respect, accountability, integrity, determination, right. positive attitude. Positive attitude. Yeah. Love that one. Now, not being an idiot either, because I think positive <laughs> is attitude... that an official one? That's an official one. <laughs> like... Positive attitude gets a bad rap, and and yeah. and actually the 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 piece on positive attitude is very interesting because yeah. it 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 really says it doesn't mean you have to be a smiling idiot no. every day. It's not about that. I think it's about it's about I don't like right. You know the word aura when people talk about an yeah. aura. I I don't really buy into that kind of stuff, but I I do think that you can bring a positive attitude and still be authoritative and still 100%. get stuff done, but just n negative attitude. I think impacts an entire room massively, and even people who don't know that it's happening yeah. can feel it. Yeah, that's 100%. what I think, and yeah. I, and I I like detest that, and I always think it's something that a positive attitude, like because I'm not that smiley, but I love to think <laughs> I really am, and like especially really early in the morning. But I do think that it's such an important thing to try and come into a room with you know a positive mind frame, and then people can. So okay, read that. so if you were to put it in more business terms, which might be more positive, if you if you could consider yourself solution focused rather than positive attitude. Yes. So that's what it's about, really. Oh, solution focus is the best. I can't stand when people just say, this is wrong, this yeah. is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And then you're like, in my head, you're like, well, how, how can that be right? Addressed. How can it just be yeah. like, so what are we going to do about yeah. it, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think it's as well that some people's minds just kind of work like that. And there's nothing wrong with troubleshooting and saying, yeah. these are the problems that we're going to encounter. So imagine you had a team of five with two people who were not solution focused yeah. and you spent 30 minutes unpicking what solution, solution focused and positive attitude meant. And you had a framework to talk to them and say, well, actually, have a think about that. Are you being as solution focused as you could be? Maybe yeah. not. And maybe you can bring people around to thinking. And it's all about awareness at the end of the day. Everything is about awareness. Yeah. You know, if you, if you don't know it exists, you can't change it. Absolutely. So where are these workshops? <laughs> <laughs> well, you could bring it in. L-I-F-T. <laughs> L-I-F-T. Ireland.ie. It yeah. sounds so exciting. So anybody can, anybody can sign up yeah. to become a facilitator. So they get trained um, over two hours. And they can then facilitate groups in their home, in their work, in yeah. their school, anywhere they want. Amazing. I mean, your career as well, it, it obviously affords you great opportunity as well. So you're an Audi ambassador. Yes, very that proud right? Audi ambassador. Um, I, I tell you, it's funny. How do I sign up for that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, this is terrible. I don't think I even told Audi this. But I, I, I decided I wanted to be an Audi ambassador before yeah. I was an okay. Audi ambassador. And I drove Audi cars for seven years before they called me. And um, the PR company rang me one day and said, oh, hi, Sonia, we're just, we're just giving you a call. We're just wondering, would you be interested in um, having a conversation 
um, around working with Audi as an ambassador. And I said, as a matter of fact, I would. I said, uh, in fact, I, I drive, drive an Audi. I've been driving an Audi. Half Audi. the battle. I've been driving an Audi for seven years. And they said, yeah, we know we've seen you. <laughs> Where so are sometimes, you? Sometimes, sometimes it pays to be loud and visible. And is it right you're the only female Audi ambassador? I think so. Yeah. In the country. Yeah. Very proud nice. to hold to hold that mantle. Yeah. Right. Okay. Or well, you're gonna have to give me the number. <laughs> I'm not sure I can do that. I mean, I'll just <laughs> just give it a try. Um. So. Just incredible things coming down the line. Sonia, thank you so much for oh, coming in. it's been in my absolute pleasure. And talk to us. And also, of course, everybody go and you can watch Sonia interview uh, incredible entrepreneurs on Architects of Business as well. And I'll be looking out for your book and your Amazing. podcast. Amazing. And I don't believe anybody can start a podcast. I take that back. <laughs> Hold on to that crown. I'm going to get in so much trouble for this entire episode. Sonia Lennon, thank you so thank much. Thank you.